I've got some scripture for us this morning before we get started with our worship service. It's in one, uh, Psalm 145, 9 and 10. It says, The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your work shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. So this morning, we're going to start out with all creatures of our God and King. Let's lift up our voices together. Would you stand, if you're willing and able, as we worship together? faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. 
faithfulness that we stand Amen. in awe of all that God has done for us and all that he will continue to do. I stand in awe. Sing together. You are beautiful beyond description to marvelous for Who 
can fathom the depth of your love. You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in all of you, holy God to whom all praise is due, I stand in all of you, you are beautiful beyond description, yet God crushed you for my sin. tender compassion who can fathom this mercy so free you are beautiful beyond description Lamb of God who died for me and I stand I stand in all of you chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 7, and Paul wrote about uh, the greatness of, of knowing Christ and knowing Jesus and having that relationship with him, and he said, he counted everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. So let's sing, I'd rather have Jesus. Have 
Thank you so much for the God that you are, uh, the great things that you have done, uh, the creator that you are, and, and that we get to be a part of your creation, and that we are dearly loved and most cherished of all your creation, Lord. Uh, what a privilege and a blessing it is to be able to call you Father, uh, to be able to have a relationship with you through the blood of Jesus, Lord, and we just uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, Father, we pray that this morning that these songs have been a blessing to you, that you have been blessed uh, through the lifting, lifting up of our voices as we have met together. Lord, we, uh, we just thank you for the opportunity to do so. And Lord, we just pray that this morning as your word is proclaimed, uh, that you would be honored and glorified. And God, that uh, as, we, as we hear your word, that our hearts would be open and our minds would be clear and uh, our eyes would be focused on Christ and what he has done for us and what he would have us do. And Lord, we just pray that uh, in all things you'd be honored and glorified. And we pray that we would respond in a way that honors you. We pray that you'd be with Brother John as he uh, proclaims the message and he stands on your word. And, and Father, we just, uh, again, thank you and love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it is good to see you this morning. I'm so thankful that you have uh, come for our morning of worship, that you uh, have given of your time uh, for God's Word today. Uh, we've been studying through the book of James, and we are going to continue in that study today, and we are going to learn about the trials of Poverty and plenty. And so James gives us some idea about um, the way that uh, money, and more specifically than just money, our mindset toward what we have, our possessions, our finances, uh, can be trials for us. And so uh, we're going to dive right in today. James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 is our text for today. And if you're willing and able, I want to invite you to stand with me out of respect for God and His Word as we read. Here's what James says to you and I. He says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have proven your love for us by sending Jesus for us. And Father, uh, in whatever state we come in today, uh, whether in poverty or in plenty, we bow before you today and we pray that we would boast only in Jesus. God, we love you. We thank you that uh, you have uh, showered your love upon us, that you have provided a means for us to know you and have a relationship with you. And so today, would you help us to see who we are and to see who we are in light of who you are, that we might rejoice in who you are and 
that we might run to you for the forgiveness that we all need. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated. Well, in this passage of Scripture, uh, James uh, is talking about trials uh, in, the, in the broader context of chapter 1, and so we have to understand this passage of Scripture, this little chunk, in light of the bigger context of what's going on. And so he's talking about trials, and he gets to this idea of the trial of poverty. Now, poverty was common in Christianity. It's hard to know exactly what the economic makeup of Christianity was in the early church. There's just not uh, a whole lot of of um, material given to that. But it does seem, based on all that we know, that most Christians came out of poverty. They were slaves, or they, became, they came from the lower class, things like that. So they, were, they, they had some level of poverty. And one of the great impacts that the early church made is in the way that they cared for those who were in poverty, and they held all things in common. The book of Acts talks about that, how people would go and they would sell everything that they they had and they would give it to the church so that the church could disperse it to people when they had need. And so when people had need, the church regularly gave to provide for the need of their brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's, it's true. Most Christians were poor. Now it's not true that all Christians were poor. That's just simply not the case. We can see that in Scripture. But because of this economic diversity, the Bible gives us specific instructions about how we're supposed to care for those who are poor. And so the Bible gives us uh, uh, some instructions about how to address poverty. The Bible doesn't clearly teach that poverty is punishment. And so it's true that in the Old Testament, wealth was seen as a blessing from God that came as a result of faithfulness. But then in the New Testament, you have all these consistent warnings about the dangers of wealth. So the Bible gives us, when we read the Bible broadly, it gives us a balanced approach and it teaches us about the, the, both the blessings and the dangers of poverty and plenty. And so there are all of these instructions throughout the Bible about how those who do have plenty or who do have some means are supposed to provide for those who have less. And so uh, here's, here's the kind of the, the broad instruction is that God does not bless you with wealth so that you can enjoy that just for yourself. But he gives you wealth so that you can enjoy that and so that you can provide for the good of others. In the Old Testament, there's this set of rules that were set up about how farm fields were supposed to not be uh, harvested around the edges and if any fell on the ground they weren't supposed to stop and pick it up after they were by the way they weren't they weren't just like using big combines the way we do everything was done by hand so when anything dropped on the ground it was supposed to stay there the outside edges were supposed to be left and that was so those who were poor could come along after things had been harvested and could have some food for themselves. And and so it was a means of provision, an instruction that God gave. Now in the New Testament, there's less emphasis on the rules about what you have to do, like can I glean the outside edges of my fields? Uh, But it's more about the, it, it more emphasizes this principle of generosity. So here's a way to understand it. In the New Testament, it's less about rules about what you have to do to provide for those who are poor and more about what you can do to provide for the needs of those who are poor. So it's less about rules about what I have to do and more about encouraging me to think about what I can do. What what can I give? What can I do without? How can I be a blessing to other people? And so that's really the, the thrust of the New Testament. We're not simply taught to feel sorry for the poor necessarily, but we're taught that we are to give of ourselves to care for the poor and the sick and the vulnerable. And so there's this biblical approach to generosity, but then there's a promise in this passage of Scripture. Let the lowly brother, and that that word lowly is, is literally the word poor. So let the poor brother boast in his exaltation. So what's the promise? promise is that God exalts the poor. But we don't need to think of this as simply God is going to exalt the poor or, or lift them up or give them good standing simply because they're poor in wallet. 
that that's not the case. God's exaltation doesn't come because you're poor in wallet. God's exaltation isn't because people live in poverty. The, throughout, throughout history, there were Christians who thought, if we just give everything that we own away, or we just, we just refuse to have any possessions, and we choose to live like the poorest of the poor of people, then God is going to give us greater blessing than He gives other people because we're giving everything that we have away. We're choosing to live like poor people. They took this very literally thinking, if we're poor, God's going to exalt us. If we're not poor, God is not going to exalt us. And that's not what James is talking about. These Christians gathered in communities as monks and nuns, and we call them cloisters. And they, they had little interaction with the world, but it was all so they could gain standing with God. That's not the message of the Bible. Instead, James is talking to those who are already in poverty because of their inability to escape it, because it was incredibly difficult in biblical days for people to escape the cycle of poverty that they were born into. When you were born into poverty, it was almost impossible to get out of poverty. But in light of the fact that James is talking to Christians, when he talks about people who were poor, he's also talking to people who are poor simply because they became Christians. It was incredibly common. And it still is, by the way, incredibly common. What we experience is so abnormal in the United States. When people come to faith uh, in, in certain countries, when people came to faith in the Bible, they started trusting and following Jesus instead of the traditional religions that they were born into. Their families would turn their backs on them. Uh, in fact, I heard a story just a couple of weeks ago about uh, a, a Muslim man who became a Christian and his, his family were, were looking to kill him because he had come to faith in Christ. His mom took him to the airport. She gave him a hug and said, I love you. But then she spit in his face and said, but you're dead to me because you're following Jesus. In other places, people will lose jobs. They'll lose their home. They'll lose um, their finances. will just be ripped away from them. So many things happen. And, and then you have... Uh, those other families who, like, like that man in that Muslim country whose mom took him to the airport and spit in his face, you have others whose moms don't help them escape. And so dads and brothers and uncles come and hunt those men and women down and they kill them simply because they trust in Jesus. James has those kinds of people in mind. Those people who lost status and family and job and home and money and everything. And he says, boast in your exaltation. Those people gave up much and they continue to give up much because they believe that Jesus is worth infinitely more than what they give up. And by the way, these people, these people don't give this up to get heaven. These people give this up to get Jesus. When you become a Christian, you do not become a Christian so that you can get heaven. You become a Christian so you can get Jesus. And heaven is just a bonus that gets added in. We are, we are so programmed to think about what we can get for ourselves. Like, what's it worth Oh, streets of gold? That sounds awesome. Gates made out of pearls? That's amazing. Walls made out of precious jewels? Sign me up. But when we ask, what do I get? And the answer is, you get a Jewish carpenter that you can follow who tells you to take up your cross every day and follow him. We go, wait a minute. That sounds hard. And it is. But the goal of Christianity is not heaven. The goal of Christianity is Jesus. You get a relationship with God. He becomes your father. That's it. That's what you get. Everything else is icing on the cake. And so these men and women who, who are lowly, who are poor, are in that condition because 
Some of them have born, been born into that condition, but others have been uh, thrust into that condition because of their trust and their faith in Jesus. So James is talking about people who are, are poor in wallet in some ways, but he's not talking about exaltation based on being poor in wallet. He's talking about exaltation because they're poor in spirit. Jesus talked about that. He introduces the greatest sermon ever preached. The first message that we have from him recorded in the Bible in Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what does that mean? Well, it means that for me to have a relationship with God through Jesus, I have to recognize that I have absolutely nothing to offer. I'm not saved because I deserve it or because I've earned it. I'm not saved because God realized how darn lucky he was going to be if he got me. God's not in heaven. He's, he's not in heaven impressed with John McDonald, and he's not in heaven impressed with any of you either. I can promise you something. I was saved in spite of who I am. In spite of what I have to offer. And in spite of how lucky God is to have me. And it's only when we realize that we have nothing to offer. That we become poor in spirit. We realize that we have nothing to give to God. And then we are in a position to accept the gift of salvation that comes not because of us. But because the goodness of who God is. And that he offers that, that gift as a gift of grace which means undeserved gift. And so God is giving us this not based on who we are but in spite of who we are. When we realize that we are nothing and we have nothing, then God exalts us or lifts us up and He makes us His children. Now imagine this. Spiritual orphans, outcast, homeless, helpless, and destitute. God looks down from His palace and sees us filthy and naked and broken and covered in shame. And He says, I am going to give My Son for that one. Not because we did anything to deserve it, but because He chose to love us in spite of our condition. And He brings us into that palace and He makes us His own. He makes us co-heirs with Christ. He cleans us up and clothes us in His righteousness and covers us in His love. And He promises that He's never going to leave us or forsake us or forget about us. And that is not because of us. It's not because of me and it's not because of you. We don't accomplish it. We just receive it. We didn't do anything for this. God just gives it to us. And unless we realize that is who we are, we can never have a relationship with God. But there's a problem for most of us in our context in America and James spends a lot of time talking about that. Now, why is it that the New Testament warns us over and over and over about the dangers of wealth? We'll learn about that right now in this passage of Scripture. Why one brief verse to, toward those who are poor and then two long verses with a, this really powerful image toward those who have much and the danger is, or the reason is because there's a danger in plenty. There's a, there's a trial in plenty. Now just like poverty was present in Christianity, wealth was also present in Christianity. In the book of Acts, Barnabas was a landowner. And landowners had wealth. Barnabas went and sold uh, a piece of land and he gave that money away to the church. Lydia was a seller of purple, which was a very lucrative business. So she made and sold purple cloth Purple cloth was hard to make, it was expensive to make, and then when you sold it, it was worth a lot of money. Late in the Gospels, there were men like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who were followers of Jesus who were also wealthy. Now, most people in Christianity were not wealthy, but there were some. But there's a problem with wealth. And it's illustrated by a story in Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. And I'm just going to kind of tell you the story. I'll encourage you to write that down and go and read that. But a, a rich young man comes to Jesus one day and he says, Teacher, what must I do to earn eternal life? 
is really what he's asking. Like, what, what do I have to do to buy eternal life? I can buy anything I want. So how much money is it going to cost me to get this? And what Jesus says broke this man down. Jesus said, go give away everything that you own to the poor. Sell all that you have. Give away the proceeds of that. And once you are completely destitute, once you have absolutely nothing in terms of money or possessions, then you come and follow me. Now, a lot of people have taken that to mean that that's what we have to do, but that's not what Jesus meant. The problem with that young man is that he thought he could leverage his wealth to get God to give him something. But Jesus told him that that's not the way it was going to be. This rich young man's problem wasn't that he was rich in wallet, but that he was rich in spirit. He's trusting himself and he's trusting his wealth to give him eternal life. He thinks that what he has is going to earn him God. But Jesus isn't trying to empty his wallet. Jesus is trying to empty his spirit. He's trying to empty his heart of pride. The trial of plenty is pride in and security in wealth and possessions. And if you were here last week, pride ought to sound kind of familiar. Last week we talked about wisdom as the killer of pride and pride as the root of all sin. And the danger in wealth is that we begin to have pride in what we have and what we can accumulate. The danger isn't just in the money. The danger is in trusting your money to do what it can never do. So James gives us another illustration in this passage of Scripture. He says, let the rich boast in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Israel, especially around Jerusalem, is a desert. It's brown everywhere. If you ever go there, there's just brown. You look to the left, there's brown. If you look to the right, there's, it's not brown brown. It's like kind of a reddish brown. And people live there and they, they are able to, to be sustained there, but there is just not much around. It's just dry. It, it hardly ever rains. But when it does, that desert, that reddish brown desert just kind of springs to life. And there's rocks and there's grass and there's all this stuff. And it just springs up out of nowhere. Out of all these rocks and, well, that's all. It's just rocks. And so you, you get grass and you get these beautiful flowers. And they're there for a little while, usually for around a half a day, maybe a day. But then what happens is the sun comes out again over this desert. And in that desert, there's a warm breeze that blows. There's just always air moving, but it's hot, baking air. It's like uh, people say all the time that, like, it, it's hot outside. Like, you go to Arizona, it's hot outside, but it's, at least it's a dry heat. Well, it's a dry heat in the oven, too. It doesn't matter. Uh, it just bakes you. And that's what happens with the flowers is they just start very quickly. When that sun comes out, and that hot wind starts blowing, it just bakes those flowers and those grasses and they wither and they die within a very short amount of time. And that's what James is telling us happens with our money. I'm, I'm terrible with handling money. Uh, there's a lady on the front row that can tell you that and there's, Jacob could tell you that. There's probably a lot of people in the room that could tell you that. I'm not good with money. When I was in college, I was horrible with money. I would... There were three dangerous places in town. There was a real, there, well, four, because two were the same. There were two sporting goods stores in town, and they were awesome. And then there was, down the road, there was a guitar shop, also awesome. And then there was a store on campus that sold CDs. And so I would get money, and I would think, hmm, I have this money. I should just go look at the CDs at the Lifeway store you know, just to look. And then I came back with two or three. Or one day I walked into the guitar shop and I saw this drum sitting there. It's in my office. I never play it anymore. 
But I saw this drum and I went, ooh, a drum. I've always wanted one of those. I should buy that. So I did. And I would call mom and I'd beg, mom, I don't have food. I'm out of food. I need you to put money in my checking account. Mom, I don't have any money for food. I didn't tell her I had a sweet drum. But, mom, I need, I need food. And so mom, as a single mother who is trying to do her best to keep food in my belly and drums and CDs in my uh, dorm room, is trying to put what money she can in. But my problem is I'm terrible at handing, handling money. You give me money, now it's kind of a game to see how long I can hold on to it. But it used to be like it was there one minute, it was gone the next. I didn't have any money anymore, but I had a pile of junk that was worthless. And eventually that stuff just ends up in a corner. Uh, not long ago, I took this big folder of CDs, because I never listened to CDs anymore. I just threw them away. Like, bunches of money. Just, it, it's worthless now. And that's what James is telling us, that whether you're good at handling money, or whether you're like me, and you're not good at handling money, stuff doesn't last Buy a nice car. Get a really nice car. You go out and buy a beautiful new car. And before long, it breaks down and it falls apart. Or you, you go and you eat that expensive meal that you've been wanting to eat because we haven't been able, able to eat out in forever. And then that turns into something else. And it's not very appetizing anymore. That amazing house you worked for for so long begins to fall apart. It needs repairs. Eventually it turns into nothing. Those nice clothes get faded and stretched and they get stuck in the back of the closet and forgotten about. That next thing that you thought would satisfy you and make you happy never fulfills you because stuff was never meant to fulfill you. It's, it's, it's like... It's like you have this hole in your life and you keep trying to cram stuff into it thinking if I just put some more in there, it's finally going to fill me up. It's finally going to satisfy. But it's like eating styrofoam. There's nothing there that's worth any value to you. And it all goes away and it all lets you down and you're left with nothing. And the truth is that all you need to get all you want is nothing. That's what James is saying. Like, all you need is nothing. All you need to approach God to get what you want is nothing. And that's why he says, let the rich boast in his humiliation. Because the rich man needs to, needs to give up trusting in his riches and his possessions and finding security in them. The rich man has to empty himself of his pride and his possession and he has to loosen his grip on his stuff so that he can grab hold of Jesus. So why is this such a big deal? It's a big deal because if my hands are closed around my stuff, I can't grab hold of Jesus. And my stuff can't save me, but Jesus can. But if your heart is full of possessions, there's no room in your heart for Jesus. So what you and I have to do is we have to humble ourselves. Because it's the only way that we can be exalted. Later in the book of James, in chapter 4, verse 10, James is going to say, humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Loosen your grip on your stuff. Stop, stop taking pride in possessions and things. Become humble before God. Recognize that you have nothing, and God is going to exalt you. But on the other hand, if you stand in pride before God, God will humble you you. In the Bible it says that one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. The idea of humility is the idea of bowed knees. It's the idea of, of kneeling before someone who is greater than you who you recognize has greater worth than you, who you recognize you're not worthy to be in the presence of. And it's, it's an act of worship when we bow humbly before someone. But the Bible doesn't just talk about those of us who want to bow our knees, 
who choose humility, it's talking about the fact that one day God is going to humble us. So we have a choice. We can bow our knees or God will one day bow our knees for us. We can humble ourselves or God will humble us. The Bible is full of this idea. So the choice is really up to us. Will we humble ourselves or will God humble us? So so what what do we do with all this? The first thing that we have to do is recognize that we have a problem. Poverty is a real problem. Poverty in America is a problem that needs to be addressed. But the Bible compels us and commands us to recognize the reality of poverty and and to seek to do something about it. Now, it's not just an American problem. It's a KZ Illinois problem. Like, I've become aware of people who had to borrow, like borrow, water from their neighbors because they didn't have water at their house. And so they just go over to their neighbors in the middle of the night and turn on the outside spigot to get a couple five-gallon buckets of water so that they had water in their home here in our town. Or other families who all they had was an outside shower So in the summertime, they could go outside and they could take a shower, but what did they do the rest of the year? What do you do in the winter if your shower is outside? I've given people toilet paper because they couldn't buy it. I have no way to guess the amount of money that we've given people for food as a church family. People who legitimately had nothing. There are hurting people all around us and we are so tempted to just close our eyes to it. Like when you walk down the street, we've been, uh, we've been, I forget where we were, I think we were in Phoenix one year at the Southern Baptist Convention. There's a guy who is laying on the sidewalk sleeping. Like he's just, and it, I mean, it's kind of late at night and we're already sort of worried because we're in a big city and I hate being in big cities anyway. We see this guy, and you know what it's so tempting to do? Like when, when you're here, and your friends are here, and that homeless guy sleeping on the ground is right here, it's really easy to just look at them and go, and keep talking and look at them and just close your eyes to the reality that you just walked right by. You'll see this if you go sit at the school sit at the grade school, you sit at the high school, you will watch these children who walk into school. And on the weekends, they don't have food. They don't get to eat. I talked to another pastor friend the other day, and, and they, they do this backpack program at their school over in Mar- or at their church over in Marshall. And they, they have to give away the little containers of macaroni and cheese because the big boxes, you have to have milk and butter to make it. And there are families that don't have milk or butter. And nobody's going to prepare the food for the kid anyway. We just don't want to think about that. But the Bible commands us that we have to think about it. Poverty is a very real problem. But we have another problem in America. And that is that we are rich in spirit. We are a nation who is I'm sorry, we're we're just not nearly as crippled by our politics as we are by our own greed and pride and selfishness. And it's not just a culture problem, it's a church problem. And it's not just an other church's problem, it's it's in this church too in some ways, and I can guarantee you that because I know that it's in me. And I would bet It's in many of you too. We are rich in spirit in far more ways than we would ever want to admit. And that is our problem. We're just prideful. And we look at things the way that culture looks at things and we must stop idolizing culture's ideas. Now, when we think about that in church, lots of people go, yeah, 
Yeah, culture. Culture is the problem. But we still adopt culture's methods of getting things done plenty of times. Like we treat churches like a business with these cutthroat tactics and traditional business approaches focusing on what benefits us rather than what we rather than just thinking about ways that we can give ourselves away for the sake of the gospel. And we fail to trust and obey the gospel because we want to make ourselves comfortable rather than embracing the holy discomfort that the Bible calls us to. And then we demonize culture and act like it's the source of all our problems, blaming it for all our failures and and trials. And by the way, this is my public service announcement that comes around at least every four years. Uh, Donald Trump isn't going to save us and Joe Biden is not going to dethrone God. And Joe Biden isn't going to save us and Donald Trump isn't going to dethrone God. That's not the way this works. God is not dependent upon who sits in the White House for him to be on his throne. God is king and he is ruler over all. And God doesn't sit in heaven and go, oh, wrong guy got elected. I guess I got to get off the throne now so he can get on my throne. Maybe in four years they'll get this fixed and lined out. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't vote and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't think carefully about how we vote. Please think carefully about how you vote. But in the Bible, Israel wanted a savior for a king. And they didn't get one. They demanded God give them a king because they wanted, they thought that the king was going to get everything right and he was going to get everything lined out and then that was a failure. And so God dethroned that king, put another king on the throne. Guess what? He was better, but he still messed up. Then his son was king, and he messed up even more. And then all these other people got, became kings, and things really began falling apart. We are not going to get a savior based on who we vote for or who we elect. I want a good president, and I want a godly president, and I want a leader who loves and follows Jesus. I want a leader who doesn't trample on the rights of people to live according to their conscience, especially when they want to live according to biblical principles. I want a president who doesn't advocate for the murder of babies, who doesn't mistreat those who are vulnerable, who leads us to care for those who are vulnerable, who are weak, who are ill, who need help. And I want a leader who always does what's best for his people. And if you want that kind of person as a leader, then stop following men and start following Jesus. Because He's the one you're looking for. He's the one you need. Now, it's not unimportant who's in the White House and who's in the Oval Office, but those people are never going to do all those things. They cannot be your Savior. They were never meant to be. But Jesus can do those things. Jesus does do those things. Jesus will do those things and more. And so that was all worth the price of admission today, I hope. But we have to stop idolizing culture's ideals and culture's ways of getting things done and culture's ways of thinking through things. And we have to embrace what the Bible teaches us. Furthermore, we have to stop hating our trials because we think we deserve more. I deserve more. I was made for more than... No, you weren't. You're not. You don't deserve better. What do we deserve? We deserve nothing. And to be truthful, we deserve less than nothing. We deserve death. That's what the Bible teaches us. We cry out for what's fair. We demand our rights. We want to think about what we deserve, that we've earned our way and so we want our way. But the Bible says that what we have earned is death. It says the wages of sin is death. We go to to work and we go to work so that we can earn a paycheck. But every day when we wake up, we go to work. Whether we go to work at our jobs or not, we just go to work doing life. 
And you get a paycheck for the life that you lead. The problem is that what you earn with the life that you lead is death. If you have ever messed up, if you have ever failed in any way, if you have ever done anything that God said not to do, or failed to do anything that God said you... If you've ever done anything God said not to do, or ever not done anything that God said you were supposed to do, then the Bible says you've sinned. This is the wages, the outcome, the paycheck you get for one sin, one failure, one mistake, one wrong move, just one. We, we want to think, all this is going to weigh out in the end. I've done this many good things. I've done this many bad things. As long as my good things outweigh my bad things, I'm going to be good. That's not the way it works. The Bible says once, one failure earns us death. So what we have earned is spiritual death apart from God's blessing and apart from God's goodness for eternity, which means forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and longer. And what we will experience apart from His blessing and goodness is His punishment towards sin forever and ever and ever and ever. And that could be the story. And we would all be at home or we would all be doing our own thing and none of us would be here because there wouldn't be any reason. But we are here because that is not the end of the story. Because that statement, the wages of sin is death, the paycheck for sin is death, also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what we do is we embrace our spiritual poverty, meaning that we realize what we deserve is punishment, but what we get instead if it is acceptance and forgiveness. We embrace our spiritual poverty so we realize that what we deserve is death, but what we get is eternal life. We embrace our spiritual poverty, meaning that we know what we deserve is hell, but what we get to experience is a relationship with God and heaven thrown in as a bonus. But until we embrace our humility, we will never experience exaltation from God. So bow yourself before the Lord and He will lift you up. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Our musicians are going to come and lead us in a time of invitation today. And we want to give you the opportunity to embrace your spiritual poverty today. If you're not a Christian, you need to understand Jesus is what you need. Jesus is all that you need. You may not know that you're looking for Him, but He is what your heart is longing for. All those things that you're chasing after, all those things that you're wanting, all those things that you, you feel are just like a black hole in your life. Like Jesus is the one that can fill that. And you can find joy and hope and fulfillment in trusting Jesus in being saved, but you have to recognize that you're a sinner, that you're not perfect, far from it. You have to believe that Jesus has been perfect for you, that He has been sinless, He has lived the life that you could not live, and that He has died in your place to take the punishment that you deserve. When He hung on the cross, He hung on the cross for you. When He died on the cross, He died on the cross for you. When He was placed in an empty tomb, He was placed in a, placed in a tomb, He was placed in the tomb dying in your place if you will ask Jesus to save you through his death and to give you a relationship with God that begins now and lasts forever the Bible says that he will if you are a Christian will you give thanks that it wasn't up to you that you didn't have to come to Jesus with full hands just laying down stuff and going is this enough Nope, go back and get a little more. Is this enough? Nope, a little more. Jesus, how about this? Nope, more. Because if it were up to us, we would never be able to bring enough. If it was up to us, we would still be lost. But because it's not up to you, because God did it for you, because it was His work and not yours, that is why you are saved. So live a life to honor Him. Live out the relationship that He's provided for you ways that you can grow in your relationship with Him, steps that you can take to become more like Jesus. 
baptism and church membership. Maybe that's something you've never done. You know you're a Christian, but it's a step that you need to take. Maybe it's learning about Jesus alongside other Christians through a Bible study or a Sunday school class so that you can know more about what the Christian life is supposed to look like. Not, not what you've heard it looks like, not what you think it ought to look like, but what the Bible says it looks like. Serve others so that they can experience the love of Jesus through you. We're never more like Jesus than when we serve other people and share His love with other people. Maybe you need to grow in your relationship with God through private study or worship or prayer or giving or Bible reading. We would love to give you the tools to help you do that. That's why Jacob and I are here to help you find those ways. Or maybe you need to tell someone else about how they can know and love and follow Jesus today. Whatever it is for you, we'll give you an opportunity to respond in just a moment. Jacob and I will be waiting at the front to talk with you and pray with you about that decision. Maybe you just need to pray, God, I don't know what you want of me, but I just, I just want to be more like you, so help me know how. We'll, we'd love to pray with you. Maybe you just want to bow by yourself and pray. Maybe you want to grab somebody else and bring them with you and have them pray with you, whatever it is. Whatever decision you have to make today, we want to give you an opportunity. We'll be waiting for you. Father, we bow before you today and we thank you for your word. We thank you that when we are poor in spirit, we can know that you are going to exalt us. When we bow our knee, that you're going to lift us up. That when we recognize we have nothing to offer, you'll give us everything that we need as you give us Jesus. And so, Father, we bow before you today and pray that you would show us how you would have us to respond to your today. Help us to love you and follow you the way that you would have us to. Help us to become more like you in the ways that we need to. We give you this time and we pray that you would ask these things in Jesus' name. If you're willing and able, I want to invite you to stand as we sing this song of invitation. This is your opportunity. If you have a decision, Yeah.
of worship today. Uh, come to worship God with us, and I pray that today you've, uh, you've learned about who He is and what He desires of us. Good news is, we need nothing. All we need is Jesus, and He's been given for us. And so my hope and prayer is that if you've never trusted Him, you will. Brother David's our deacon of the week. He's going to close us in a word of prayer today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. It's been good to be in your house. It's been good to have fun in Sunday school and to learn about your word. We thank you for the music. We thank you for those leading. We thank you, Father, for Brother John's message and for a time in which we can examine our own lives. We thank you for the blessings of being here and a simple blessing of just being here in a group form and being safe in God's house with God's people. We just ask that you use us as we go forward this week. Let us minister to those around us. Let us share the wealth that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen.